moment in the world we see major shift of powers, not only of people that change power, but of uh, uh, social strata that had power on and lose power. One of the groups that are losing power is the one you belong to, the intellectuals and the, the media and the writers, the thinkers. They are just about, nobody uses, needs them anymore. Um, are we in danger of getting extinct, we the intellectuals? I don't think so, and I think uh, it is part of the shifts that are going on. Um, it, it, it in fact, the delegitimization of experts is a, a political uh, tool used by populists uh, to retain, to gain and retain power. Very often intellectuals and scientists and people that work with data uh, present evidence that uh, show that some of the things that people in power uh, want to do are bad ideas. And uh, we need intellectuals, we need uh, science to fight uh, what I have called ideological necrophilia, in which leaders fall in love with dead ideas, uh, with intellectual cadavers. Uh, these are ideas that have been tried and tested uh, in the past or elsewhere, and they fail and they create a lot of human suffering, yet they become popular. Uh, and a lot of the populists these days are in love with uh, bad ideas that have been tried and have failed. So that's what we are uh, getting from the populist side. Do you think on the other side, on the intellectual side, there are new ideas that would be worth saving or are the intellectuals as well part of, well, uh, fighters for, for bad or for, for dead ideas? There is no doubt that uh, the, some intellectuals uh, uh, and, and have oversold uh, their skills and their abilities. Uh, but not all, I all ideas are, uh, need to be thrown out. Uh, there are some very powerful ideas that we need to respect, to cherish and protect. Uh, freedom, for example, is an important one. Democracy is another important one. Um, try to uh, collaborate instead of uh, uh, just fighting is, a, is another one. So, you know, there are some very powerful ideas that deserve uh, to be protected. And if, you know, some of them we might call values, um, and those require an intellectual underpinning very often uh, to, to explain why they're so important. One of the, the problem with the values we have, we, we share, we might defend is that they are not well uh, seen like this everywhere in the world. There has been uh, uh, people have tried to do it multilateral way in the climate uh, accords, in human rights, on the United Nations basis. Will we be able to to defend some kind of universal set of values, or will we have to step back to some more regional approach? There are many different examples in the ones uh, you gave. You know, climate change is not a value. Climate change is not a, a hope. Uh, climate change is a scientific uh, reality uh, shared by 99.9% .9 of the scientists. Uh, you can argue convincingly and legitimately that climate change is a scientific reality and that we better do something about it. Uh, and then there is democracy. Uh, democracy is also uh, perhaps more of a value, more the, the notion that uh, freedom uh, uh, is uh, something worth uh, defending. Will we be able to make this? Democracy, freedom, human rights as one set of well things. In the 90s we thought this might be something the, the whole world can agree upon. At the moment we are getting far away from this. I don't know far away is the right thing to say. Uh, in uh, surveys around the world, uh, very few people say that they would like to live in a system like there is in Russia or in China today. Uh, people will tell you that they would rather live in a democracy. What is happening is that very often those same people are tricked by uh, Democrat, by autocrats disguised as Democrats. 
they win elections uh, pretending to be Democrats, and then once they are in power, they stealthily undermine the checks and balances uh, that characterize democracy. They repress the media or they buy the, the media and put them at their service. They limit uh, uh, and control and repress the judicial, the independence of the judicial system. They intervene in parliament uh, and try, uh, you know. So the whole mechanics uh, that uh, characterize a democracy are stealthily, clandestinely, not visibly uh, uh, erased. So people that voted and they live in a democracy, in fact, they discover that more and more they're living in an autocracy. Uh, the examples of Turkey, uh, of Russia, of Venezuela, uh, and, and others are, are very good examples. There has been one power in the world while well, standing up against these kind of autocracies, these kind of perversions of democracy in the United States. Will they do it further on, you think? Or will the world be left alone with its battle about democracy and freedom? That is a question about Donald Trump. Possibly, uh, yes. Uh, because you would have not asked that question in the middle of the Obama presidency. Yes, you're right. Um, so we don't, the answer then is we don't know. Uh, Donald Trump has said a lot of things, and the contrary, uh, too. Uh, and Donald Trump is going also to discover that some of the things that he wants to do cannot be done. Uh, but it is true that uh, what the little we know about his real thoughts about these issues show that his enthusiasm uh, to protect democracies and human rights in other countries, like Russia, for example, don't seem to be very pronounced. Yeah. Yeah. As you said before, most people would prefer to live in democratic systems and not in autocratic systems in the world. Just this one uh, prediction for the, the world in, within four years. Will people within four years still prefer to live in democracy, still prefer to live in the West as we know it today? I will answer you with the results uh, of a survey in Latin America asked uh, what is the system that you like the most? You know, the answer that is a democracy. Uh, the country that uh, is the, the, the country that is at the top, the, 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 where the population says that they want a democracy is Venezuela, which is today in Latin America, together with Cuba, uh, the country that has less democracy. So they have tried uh, how it is to live in a system that is undemocratic, and they're now saying that they would like to have democracy. So the sad story here is that in, some, in many countries, or some countries, we'll experiment with uh, non-democratic forms of government only to then discover that they want to go back to their imperfect, slow-moving uh, democracy. And some of them, sadly, will discover that going back is hard, that those in power that are autocratic and dictatorial are, are not that uh, keen to re relinquish power. So getting rid of dictators is a very difficult thing. Uh, just one last question, if you allow it. You said going back is hard. Maybe we will see a situation in the United States where a lot of people are forced to go back. They are forced to go back mostly to Latin America, to Mexico and to other countries of Latin America. Will this cause problems in the countries where they will uh, have to return to? Or is it more a solution if people from the United States get back to Chile, Venezuela, Brazil, Mexico? The numbers, except for the Mexicans in the United States, the numbers are not that significant. And there it's very interesting because at the same time that uh, Donald Trump is saying that he wants to cut off um, the flux uh, and the, flu the flow of uh, uh, the Mexicans, uh, undocumented immigrants from Mexico to the United States, he is making decisions and making statements that are weakening the Mexican economy. And a weak Mexican economy creates less jobs and therefore creates more incentives 
for Mexicans to try to reach the United States. And he, talking about uh, ideological necrophilia, he doesn't uh, realize that uh, building walls uh, w is a bad idea that has been tested and it doesn't work, um, especially in the age of globalization. We'll wait and see. Thank you for your patience with us. Thank you very much.